Turn to chapter 4 this morning of Book of Romans. According to our outline here, we're dealing with the second division of Paul's epistle to the Romans. While we'll be stressing the nature of justification in our biblical theology classes on Wednesday, in chapters 4 and 5 I'm going to deal with the uh, fact of justification, which is by faith and not so much the nature of it. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh has found? If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I want you to notice how often in Romans 4 it is said that faith is a charge to our account, or we're counted as. It never says you are righteous, because you're not. Well, three or four have already gotten the message, but... In our biblical theology class, you'll find out the scriptures plainly teach the fact that God, because of our faith in Christ, treats us as righteous, counts us as righteous, sees us as righteous, but he never says we are. Because, well, there'd be no point in chapters 1 to 3 to show that all are unrighteous. He said in chapter 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. So how then could he see us in any way but unrighteous, but by faith he counts us as righteous. Now I notice that's what's said here over and over. Verse 3, Abraham's faith was counted unto him for righteousness. It was charged to his account, because on the books he's guilty. But to him that worketh not, verse 5, believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You see, it's counted in the place of you're not having it. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. See, righteousness is imputed to us. It's charged to our account, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. See, there it is again. That's about four times. How was it reckoned? While he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. In other words, he was counted as righteous before circumcision. Remember, the covenant of circumcision was given to Abraham. Verse 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe, that's us, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. There's imputation of righteousness again. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world, Now, 1 Corinthians 3 says the world is ours. Galatians and Romans says we become children of Abraham by faith. That's quite significant. Now, he became the heir of the world. You see, the world doesn't belong to the devil. All of this old, dead, denominational negative teaching that tells you you don't have a thing over here, you're going to get it over there. God never made the world for you to misuse, but you're a Christian. There's anything wrong with going to bed satisfied that you're not going to bed hungry like a lot of people are, that you're well and uh, your debts are paid. What's wrong with that? Well, he's the heir of the world. For the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, then faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Now that's a verse, most people don't know what it means, but it's explained in chapter 5, and we'll wait till we get there. He says, where there's no law, there's no transgression. 
But he says men died anyway. Why? Because he didn't say there was no sin. There was simply no transgression of a law. If there's no law there to transgress, but men were still sinning anyway. Therefore, it's of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed and not to that only which is the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Amen. Did you know you had a spiritual father? Most, most Christians think Abraham was the father of the Jews. He was. He was the beginning of the Hebrew race. But we are children of Abraham Amen. by faith. Or by faith, we are made children of Abraham. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. You see, Gentiles too. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Abraham, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. There's his positive confession. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore, here it is again, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. It's interesting that the resurrection is the basis of our justification, but more of that later. Amen. Without the resurrection, there'd be no uh, teaching, there'd be no epistle of Romans, there'd be no teaching uh, this morning on justification by faith. The resurrection, we were justified on the basis of his resurrection. Being justified by faith, faith in his work at Calvary. But the resurrection is what sealed the thing. So the divine verdict is all the world unrighteous and guilty before God. Now all the world is not somebody out there in the gutter who's drunk this morning. That's us. The whole world condemned. None righteous. No, not one. I trust you heard the other messages. If you didn't, they're on tape. And that'll bring you to the place of what your standing was before God before you received the gospel into your heart. But you see, God didn't leave sinners there. The whole world, chapters 1 to 3, guilty, condemned, and God said he gave them all up. That's what he says. said it three times in Romans 1. God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave us up. Now he begins with the promise that justification, the divine plan that God had all along, is going to be justification by faith. Not by works, not by deserving it or trying to merit it, not through circumcision, not through the law, not through anything, but like Abraham believing the promise. He was justified, as we'll see, on the basis of a promise of a son. He was not justified by law or by circumcision, but by his belief of a, the promise God made him of a son. You've got to believe something, you see. And so that's what he believed, because the cross hasn't come yet. He had a revelation of Christ because the Bible tells us that he did. But the significant thing is the Bible stresses over and over, righteousness charged his account, imputed to him because of his faith. So justification is the big, is the central doctrine of the New Testament, of course. And like so many others, most Christians don't have much conception of what it's all about. What is justification? We'll be dealing with it, as I said, as I said in the biblical theology class. But justification is judicial decree. It's a legal transaction just like in a court of law. It's the judicial decree on God's part to impute righteousness to guilty sinners on the basis of their faith in Jesus Christ. As soon as you exercise faith, there is a legal transaction takes place in the courts of heaven. Now that isn't just a figure of speech. Uh, the cross and the work and the means of justification, everything else, is as legal, even more so, as, as a court of law that if I'm guilty of some crime or some violation of the law and I have no way to pay, and someone who is innocent of that violation comes in and offers to pay my debt, who is innocent of that violation, see, if he's guilty of it, then he can't stand in my place, 
offers to pay the debt, and the judge will accept that. Of course, some crimes excluded, but we're using an illustration. The judge will accept that. And he, by judicial decree, declares me not guilty because the penalty's been paid. And that's put on the books that way. And God's got a book of records. You better believe it. Sure. Yes, he has. He talks about the books in the Bible in more than one place. The book of life, and then there's a book of the works. And on his book of records, we're all seen to be guilty. We owe a debt we can't pay. But there was a guiltless one, his own son, God himself, who said, I'll go stand in their place and pay their debt on the basis of your faith in the merits of Christ, what he earned for us at Calvary. Then God imputes righteousness to us, erases the guilt, covers it over with the blood of Jesus, erases it out of the book by covering it over with the blood, and charges to our account the debt is paid. I mean, it's written on the books, debt paid for Hobart E. Freeman and for John Doe or Mary Smith or whatever your name is out there. See, imputation, and it's used over and over here in chapter 4, so Christians ought to know what imputation is. This is why we study. Imputation means that God counts us, reckons us as righteous on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, had we been guiltless, we would be righteous. But we are not guiltless, so we're unrighteous. That's what chapters 1 to 3 said over and over and over. None righteous, no, not one. None seeking after God. None with any knowledge. They've all gone out of the way. They've all together become unprofitable, God said. But on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ, he imputes righteousness to us. That means he looks at the books and he writes down here, first of all, he erases the charge against it, says debt's paid, and over on the uh, credit side, he credits to our account righteousness, which we don't have. It's a legal transaction. And when you get there, you'll find out we're telling you the way it is. Now, Romans 4 is one of the, well, actually is probably the monumental chapter on justification by faith, but of course the whole epistle is teaching this. Like when we started out, chapter 1, verse 17, we showed you the theme of the epistle, the just shall live by faith. And over in chapter 3, 28, he said, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Then over in chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so justification by faith is the theme of the epistle, but Romans 4 is the monumental passage that stresses this, both to Jew, a Jew can come here and see how to be justified, as well as a Gentile. Faith is the basis, and it's set forth very clearly here in chapter 4. Now, chapter 5 is going to set forth the benefits of justification by faith. We have peace with God. We have access into the grace. We have hope. We develop endurance and experience, and all of these things are set forth in chapter 5 that we'll begin dealing with next week. Romans 4, the basis of justification, it's by faith. Romans 5 will be the blessings of justification. Now, Romans 4 is also one of the clearest passages refuting that error that we dealt with earlier in probably a biblical theology class, that the Old Testament saints were unregenerate, saved but unregenerate. We have even got uh, books out uh, teaching such nonsense. The Old Testament sa saints were saved but unregenerate, that a man couldn't be born again or regenerated till after the cross. This is the teaching. Now, we've already dealt with that. It's on a tape, so we're not going to go through all of the details and explanations of that this morning. To be unregenerate is to be unrighteous. I mean, you can't have an unregenerate righteous man. The terms are mutually exclusive. And so if Abraham were unregenerate, since all Old Testament saints up until after Calvary are said to be unregenerate. If he was unregenerate, then he was unrighteous. And yet again and again and again, I just pointed out to you, I stopped to do it time after time, that we were told Abraham, because of his faith, was declared to be counted as, reckoned as righteous. That's through all of those verses we stopped to look at. Now in verse 11, it says, because of our faith, we become children of righteous Abraham. And over in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, we are told there that because of our faith, 
we become the seed of Abraham. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Well, you know what seed is in the Bible. It's the descendants, the children you produce, and heirs according to the promise. In verse 7 of chapter 3 of Galatians, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And so think of what the implications are. The Old Testament saints, unregenerate, then you are the seed and children of old unregenerate Abraham. So what does that make you? I mean, wonder if these people who come up with these errors and heresies and what have you ever really stop to think of the implications of some of these things, like the error that Jesus became literally a sin on the cross, became unregenerate, had to be born again and justified and you almost uh, have to apologize for even quoting those statements that some are making, wonder if they understand the implications of such statements. The implication is if he became a sinner on the cross, then the next question is, well, who died for Jesus? And no man can stand in your place unless he is guiltless and free of any condemnation himself. And so if Abraham's unregenerate, then the question is, what does that make you? But the purpose of Galatians, especially Galatians and Romans, the purpose is to show that the Old Testament saints were justified the same way we are, received the same results we did, and the justification, the basis is by faith. As we pointed out when we dealt with this subject, that faith, not Calvary, is the basis of the new birth. Uh -huh. Amen. Now think about that for a moment. Calvary provides salvation. Faith is the means by which you obtain it. And you're born again because you believe the gospel. John 3, plain as day. You're not born again because of Calvary. You're born again because of your faith in Calvary. So the men were, as Romans 4, as Romans epistle and Galatians teach us, that men were justified by faith before the law was ever given. So the point is, justification uh, by faith Count you, causes you to be counted as righteous, and a person who's righteous can't be unregenerate. I mean, he was counted as righteous, and Paul says we're counted as righteous. Nowhere does it say either Abraham or we are righteous because God's already said we were unrighteous. But the point is, he was counted as righteous, and if we believe like he did, we're counted as righteous. Now, do you believe you're unregenerate? Then how could he have been unregenerate? What's Calvary got to do with regeneration or new birth? That doesn't produce it. It's your faith in that that produces it. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, well, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And he said, how can you be born again? Can you enter a second time into your mother's womb and be born again? He said, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? You see, he should have already known it. He was a teacher of Israel. That's an Old Testament truth. The point is, the new birth and justification by faith are not New Testament truths. They are, well, this is what Romans 4 is all about, to show us that justification by faith is not a new doctrine in the New Testament, that Abraham, the father of all who have faith, was justified by faith. I want to tell you something that maybe most of you don't know, but the Bible shows it, and that is that Abraham did not have some inferior revelation concerning justification. He had a greater revelation than most Christians I talked to. That's a fact. Abraham didn't have some inferior revelation. On the contrary, if we have faith, the scriptures say we become the children of Abraham. Well, I know we're called the children of God. But over and over says if we have faith like he had faith, we become his children. Now, I wouldn't call that an, an inferior revelation. He doesn't become what we are. We become what he was by faith. And the scriptures say that the gospel was preached before to Abraham. Now, the word of God says that, that he heard the gospel and believed it. Jesus himself in John 9 said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He didn't have the full New Testament revelation we've got about all the doctrines. The church wasn't even revealed in the Old Testament. But by the way, that's the only doctrine that isn't revealed in the Old Testament. It's the church. Paul says three times that was a mystery. But Abraham had deep revelation. And he didn't have some inferior revelation about how you're going to get saved. In fact, it says that if we have faith, we'll be blessed with Abraham. With him, not he with us. So how in the world can he be unregenerate if he heard the gospel before we did? How can he be unregenerate if he was justified by faith before we were? 
How could he be unregenerate if the promises were made to him and not to us? And if, if we have faith, we'll enter into his promises. It says, those who are in Christ become the seed of Abraham and heir to the promises made to Abraham. Galatians 3.29. So we need to see the importance of justification by faith. How could he be unrighteous when the scriptures say he was righteous? Way back in Genesis 15, 6, it was counted, his faith was counted to him for righteousness. He believed God, and it was charged to his account that he was righteous. So God doesn't say in the Bible that he's going to bless all of his children who have faith. I'm going to bless Abraham because he had faith, and I'll bless Isaac, and I'll bless Jacob, and I'll bless Hobart, and I'll bless Peter, and I'll bless Paul, and bless you, and all the Christians because they have faith. He didn't say that. He said, if you have faith, then I'll let you enter into his blessings, Abraham's. Oh, that's tremendous. That the whole purpose being set forth here, dear friends, is to refute some of these latter-day errors. Well, whether it's errors of Christendom or Judaism or whatever are the latter-day ones about the atonement and so forth and so on or the means of justification. That is to say, righteousness was imputed to Abraham and the Christian in the same way. It means the same thing, produces the same results. And that's what the stress in Romans and Galatians is over and over. See, Abraham is a connecting figure between the Old and New Testament. He's really the only one. Well, actually, a lot of important Figures appear in the Old Testament, like Adam's important because he was the first man, and Noah important because he was the only righteous man of his day, Isaiah important because he was the great prophet and preacher of the Old Testament, and many people are important, Moses and others we could name, but Abraham stands out in a unique way because he's the father of three races. Three, yes, he's the father of the Arabians. All the Arabian tribes descend from Abraham through Hagar, and Ishmael. He's the father of the Hebrew race through Isaac and Sarah. But he's also the father of a third race because God made him the heir of the world. That is the world of believers. He's the father of a spiritual race. If you turn to Galatians 3, we're told that he's the father, spiritual father of all who have faith. He is unique in that sense. He's the connecting figure between the Old and New Testament. Why? God purposely wants to show that the way he was justified and what made him righteous and regenerate is the way, the only way that we will be justified. Galatians 3, verse 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You notice it was accounted, charged his account, imputed. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Well, now we're Gentiles, at least I guess most of us are, but we are his children by faith. We are the children of Abraham, the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preach before the gospel to Abraham. Now, you thought I was making it up somebody? There it is. God preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham and said, In thee shall all nations be blessed, are blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Not he with us, but we with him. Inferior revelation, Old Testament saints, unregenerate, well how could you justify unregenerate people? But he is the spiritual father to all who have faith. Now, justification is by faith. As I say, most Christians, they talk about it or hear it from the pulpit, they really don't know what it is. And yet, the very means by which they're going to enter the kingdom is what they don't know much about. Justification by faith. Righteousness imputed to them. Sometimes you run around with the robes of righteousness wrapped around them like they are righteous. No. God imputes Jesus' righteousness to us. He is righteous, and when we believe on him, he charges his righteousness to our account. As if, and from then on, he'll treat us as if we were righteous. But he's already said we're not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. No, a righteous person is a person who obeyed God from the womb and right on through life, as Jesus did. Besides that, uh, he didn't have the handicap of a fallen nature, so we would be bankrupt even before we tried. But justification is by faith, and by faith righteousness is imputed to us. Now, the Jews came to the place where they thought that uh, it was by works and not by faith, although Abraham is the example even to them. 
and churches today will criticize the Jews, and yet I don't know of a denomination that doesn't have its own system of works, how you enter the kingdom, how you get saved. We've got a Southern Baptist plan, we've got a Lutheran one, a Methodist one, and you know you've got a Catholic one. Now, Catholics who are honest will tell you that's the only way. You better believe it. Oh, listen, friends, I've done a lot of reading and studying something besides Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans. You get into the Catholic creed, you'll find that's the only way. And while they may be saying something right now, you know, there's a purpose and all that, they don't really believe that. I mean the leaders. I'm not talking about the Catholics who are getting baptized in the Spirit and so forth. But I'm going to say this because it needs to be said, and it's true whether you're talking about Catholics or Baptists or whatever, a person who really gets baptized in the Spirit and goes on fulfills the purpose for which God baptized him in the Spirit, eventually is not going to be a Baptist charismatic or a Catholic charismatic. There's no such thing in the Bible. People are just, you know, trying to burn the candle to both ends and have it both ways, have their cake and eat it too. They don't want to sever their ties with their old denominational apron strings. The churches today, it's true. Although, of course, I know if you confront them with such statements, outside Catholics, Catholics who are honest will tell you that. Now, that's in their creed. Justification by works and faith. Let him be anathema who says that justification is by faith alone without works. For a man is justified by faith and works. That's right in the creed and things much stronger than that. And that the Catholic Church is the only true visible church on earth and so forth. Well, anyway, and equate the church with the kingdom. To be in the church, be in the kingdom. If you're not in the church, you're not in the kingdom of God, and so on. Uh, regardless of what's happening to a lot of Catholics who are becoming charismatic, we're talking about the Catholic Church. It's a part of Babylon, but so is the whole denominational system. And one day, we're all going to see that. Some of us who know it and admit it ahead of time are not going to be brokenhearted when we see the system just wiped out and erased by God. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's already on its way down. It has only a spark of life left. And all it, all it awaits is God just removing his hand. And we'll see that these things are not fanatical and not religious heresy to say them. But the denominational system was never invented by God. It's a way of works. I don't care whether it's Baptist works. And listen, I came through the Southern Baptist system. I've got about 14 years of that. I know a little bit. You can learn something in 14 years as a pastor and a student in their colleges and seminaries. And while you would never admit it, you don't give a whole lot of hope for anybody but a Southern Baptist. A Baptist, really, but Southern Baptist. Why, why do they come up north and say Southern Baptist Church? Because that's really the right Baptist, is the Southern Baptist. That's what they're saying. They've got their own program and beliefs and creeds of how you get saved, and you can't get any two to agree on anything, whatever you name. And then there are those, of course, who openly teach works and faith, like the Catholics, like the Seventh-day Adventists, like the Worldwide Church of God, and so forth. And so the implications of justification by faith are significant for our time right now because not only is the denominational system, a system of works and faith, works mixed with faith, faith mixed with works, but there's a lot of perversion of justification, such as Old Testament saints being unregenerate. And see, while you may not understand the implications, your mind may not be like mine or some others that as soon as we hear a thing, we line it up with the word. If we can't, then we find out what's wrong with it and discard it if it won't line up with the word. Maybe that isn't the way your mind functions, but the implications of a lot of these things you're hearing out of charismatics today are quite serious. Amen. It's like a brother asked yesterday, well, someone heard your tapes on submitted body, and it sounds like you're saying if you're out from under the covering of the blood of Jesus, uh, that, you know, it's tantamount to not being saved. That's what they think you're saying. I said, tell them that's what I am saying. <laughs> I said, what we're saying there is that if you're not under the covering of the blood of Jesus and you put yourself under the covering of man, you don't have a covering. Right. Now, first of all, I said that will mean that you have no covering of protection and healing and the promises of God and so forth. Uh, and I said, if that error is pointed out to that person, they persist in trusting in some man rather than God, then the scriptures are fulfilled. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his own. He's under a curse. And if the Israelites would not 
have obeyed God and gone into that covering of blood that he had provided, then that would, be, that would show they were unregenerate, that they were not saved. The Israelite who didn't get under there had no protection. But it wasn't just that his physical life would be spared, but by his lack of faith in the revelation, he would show he was not saved. So I said, tell them that's what I am saying. Yeah. It doesn't mean right now they're unsaved, but it means if they persist in that and remove themselves from the covering of Jesus, then they're only going to show that they do not have a justifying faith to begin with. That's what, it, that's what I'm saying. These implications are quite serious. So that's why God has a studying Romans. Justification by faith, just not some old doctrine. Well, ho-hum, one of the fundamentals of faith. I already know that. I already believe that. Let's get on to sanctification. What's that mean? That's Methodist doctrine. We better skip that and get on to... <laughs> I want to be glorified. No, I think we've already seen there's a whole lot to justification. <laughs> Abraham's example is put in here for us. We're justified by faith and blessed with Abraham because he was justified by faith. And Paul labors in Romans and Galatians to prove one point, that justification before God, you'll never be received by God except simply saying, I believe. And the three ways he proves justification by faith. And remember, he's always using Abraham as our spiritual father in illustration. First of all, Abraham was justified by faith and not the works of the law. Why? He was justified by faith over four centuries before the law was ever given. Romans 4.13, first of all. So this must mean that the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, if you turn to Galatians 3, you'll see that Paul in Galatians is clarifying or carrying on the same ideas as in the book of Romans, especially chapters 4 and 5. See, remember the Jews had come to the place where they believed they were justified by works, the works of the law. Remember way over in Acts 15, Christian Jews, Pharisees, the requirement was that they were going to have the Gentiles who believe be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. It's right in the New Testament. They hadn't been delivered of that belief yet, and they were Christians until God called Paul and gave him the revelation, stressing what the Old Testament actually taught, justification by faith. Now, Christians often think Jews were justified by the law, and they're justified by faith. The average Christian, you'll ask, will think that. The Jews, well, they were under law. That's the way they uh, receive uh, forgiveness and were justified, and we're justified by faith. And yet the scriptures here in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, and in 16 to 18, prove that Abraham was justified by faith over four centuries before the law was given. So it was faith that was to be the type, not the law. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Notice, whose blessings? <laughs> oh, friends. I'll tell you, we're blessed with him. The blessings of Abraham is what you receive when you believe those 7,487 promises in the Bible. The blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's how you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. We're the seed. But saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. This I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. He said, the covenant God made with Abraham, which was a covenant of faith, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. He said, the covenant and the promise that God made to Abraham, the law which came 430 years after, cannot change it, cannot abrogate it, cannot disannul it to make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more of the promise, but God gave it to Abraham the promise. Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Worldwide Church of God, Roman Catholics, Southern Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, take note. It's faith. It's the promise. Genesis 15, 6. That's about as far back as you can get. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Amen. Now the second, back to Romans 4. The second basis of Abraham's justification, that is to show that he was not justified by works, the second reason 
why he was justified by faith without works has to do with the covenant of circumcision, which is given in Genesis 17. God gave the covenant of circumcision to Abraham. The circumcision was not the basis of justification, but his obedience, his belief of God, and the circumcision itself became a mark in the flesh, just like you'd cut your chest or something and say, see that mark? That proves I'm a Christian. That proves I believe God way back there about something he said he would do if I would believe it. And I just put that mark there. Uh, you can put it on your forehead. Of course, I'm using an example. Uh, but then circumcision is quite an example. It's in the flesh, and it's permanent. And so the Jews had come to trust in their favored position with God was that because of their circumcision. They kept the law, said that's the way we'll be justified. They said, now this is proof that we're heirs of Abraham, children of Abraham, that we're in the kingdom because we've been circumcised. Well, notice what he says in Romans 4, 8 to 11, that Abraham was justified before circumcision. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, that is Israel, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. In other words, the promise came before the covenant of circumcision, is his point. And he received the sign of circumcision, which is a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had being yet uncircumcised. See, the circumcision only testified that the Jew had faith. That's why Paul labors, we've already brought this out, to show that if all you've got is the outward sign of circumcision in the flesh, and you're not circumcised in your heart, then you're not a child of Abraham. So <clears throat> the righteousness came to Abraham by faith, being yet uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all Christians and all believers, of all them that believe though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. He is the spiritual father of the faithful, not merely those who had the law or who were circumcised, so that God could use him as an illustration to indicate that before or after the cross, righteousness comes by faith, that a man is born again by faith, just like he told Nicodemus. You mean you don't know you should be born again, the new birth? He said, Nicodemus, you should know it. That was before the cross. So no man could ever be justified by the law, Paul says in Romans 3, 19 and 20, by the law comes the knowledge of sin. That shows you you're a sinner. That just reveals the fact that you're a sinner. No man can claim favor in God's sight because he's circumcised because the circumcision in the flesh isn't the basis of acceptance with God. Although Genesis 18 said, if a man refuses circumcision, his soul will be cut off from Israel. But see, that would only prove he didn't have faith in what Abraham was saying about the covenant that they were to enter into. You see, the outward sign of circumcision doesn't prove anything except you might have faith. Without it, we know you don't have it, God was saying. So here he says in Romans that Abraham's circumcision was a sign that he had faith in the promises of God. And that's the third reason why we see he was justified with, by faith without works is because in the third place Abraham the scriptures show was justified by faith in the yet unfulfilled promise that God had made him a promise of a son and the very nature of the promise excluded any works on Abraham's part now think for a moment a hundred years old who do you know is producing children who's a hundred <laughs> wife ninety not only that, God had allowed her womb to be closed so that it would be seen as a miracle. She had never born a son, couldn't have children, medically impossible. And in spite of the medical reports, God said to Abraham, 25 years before it happened, said, I'm going to give you and Sarah a child. Hallelujah. And then to remove any possibility that Abraham would try to help God, or think that he was helping God, God didn't let their first relationship produce a son. Not the first year, not the second, not the third, or the fourth, or the fifth, or the tenth, or the fifteenth. He waited one decade, waited to still no son. God's removing every possibility that Abraham or the world or you or I or anyone would ever think that what happened 
was anything but a miracle. That's right. And so over in Genesis chapter 15, verses 2 to 4, we have this recorded. And Abraham, you know, after he's waited two or three years probably, he says, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I still go childless, you see? He says, the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. In other words, the, the uh, one who supervised Abraham's holdings. But after all, he was a rich man. Remember the scriptures say that. And he says, we're heirs of the promises made to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I denied my rights too long. Last 10 years, I've been claiming everything that Abraham had. And God has been faithful. Well, he says, who's going to be my heir? He's, he, you know, he doesn't know. He doesn't have the book of Romans and Galatians written. The Old Testament isn't even written. He's way back in 15 after it gets written. <laughs> Genesis 15. He doesn't know all the outcome. He doesn't know he's going to wait 25 years. And so at first, like natural inclination would do, he's going to try to help God. Is it Eliezer that you, this, that was a spiritual son you were giving me? And it's Eliezer, the hired servant who's over my household. And then later on through Hagar, they get an Ishmael and Sarah and Abraham try to offer God an Ishmael. That's a son of the flesh. And Galatians also makes that an allegory, you see, and shows that how Hagar's son was a son of the flesh. Isaac was the son of the promise. Well, anyway, we read the word of the Lord came to Abraham saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels, thy loins shall be thine heir. You see, God said, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 21, 22, 23, 24. We've already passed up all the people in the church who've been waiting for a fulfillment. You say, why do I have to wait so long sometimes for a manifestation to see if you're really a child of Abraham? That's why. Because you see, he got those blessings by his faith, receiving the promise by faith and then waiting for the manifestation. And do you think you're going to be heir of the promises made to Abraham and a child of him and have to have everything manifested instantaneously or immediately and say, oh, I'm a child of Abraham by faith. Well, how could you demonstrate it? How could you prove? Oh, why did I go through such trials? Why did I have to wait? Why? It's been two years or three or six months. When's this ministry going to come forth? Somebody's saying already while I'm talking that he keeps talking about. <laughs> now, if I just want to say who was honest, raise your hand, you would raise it but I could point him out who just had that thought. That's okay. It's a good thought. I'm answering it. <laughs> when, 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 when? Why does God have us to wait for manifestations and so forth? Well, to see if your John 3:16 faith is Hebrews 10, 23 faith. Hold fast your confession of faith without doubt. <laughs> see if your John 3, 16 faith is James 1 faith. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse kinds of trials, knowing the trying of your faith works endurance. <laughs> Hallelujah. To see if you have that kind of faith. I mean, talk's cheap. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Turn over to James 2. Abraham, we've shown you in three ways, was justified by faith without works. And then James comes along and said he was saved by a faith that works. <laughs> How about that? Is he contradicting Paul? Well, no, I think God a long time ago would have gotten one of the books out of the Bible if they contradicted. What kind of a God do people worship? It has the power to create this universe and knows where every speck of sand is lying right now all over the world. <laughs> know the very hairs of your head are numbered. And yet would leave two books in the Bible that somebody would say contradict themselves. What is James saying? Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and not works? Can faith save him? See, all the stress is justification by faith, justification by faith without works. Well, James is saying, if a man says he has faith, will faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart, be in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful for the body, well, then what does your faith profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Faith 
without corresponding actions is dead. That's what the scripture says. James 2.17 is scripture. It's inspired. Written by Jesus' own brother, James. Paul was a rebel. Not that I say you have to choose, but why do people... Well, even Luther, bless his heart, he didn't have all the light he should have. He said, James, destroy a little book. But he threw out a lot of books that he didn't think was inspired. That doesn't mean anything. And so people come along today in these old seminaries of unbelief say, well, Paul said faith, justified by faith without works, and James says you're justified by faith with works. Not if you put it together. Not if you put it together. James has already told you what he means. Yea, a man may say you have faith and I have works. He says you show me your faith without your works. Go ahead. We'll give any of you five minutes. All the time you want this morning. Show me your faith. Can you take it out and say, look, this is faith. This is what faith looks like. No, the only way you can see faith is at work, producing something. He said, I'll show you my faith because it works. Thou believest there is one God. Well, you do well. That's a good belief. But he says the demons also believe that and tremble. What have you proven because you believe there's only one God? And his name is Jesus Christ. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now watch what he's saying in the context. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? How? When he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. You see, the promises of a son. He waits 25 years. It's a miracle baby. Then when he gets him, God says, kill him. <laughs> well then what kind of faith would he have had if he'd start doubting God at that point he said through Isaac all the seed is going to come well how could he do it if he's dead that took more faith than believing for a son his offering Isaac is his faith at work that's what James is saying seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works his faith was made perfect see he doesn't rule out faith but by demonstration his faith was brought to perfection. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. I wonder if people who try to find a contradiction between James and Paul have ever read verse 23. He just quoted it. He says the scriptures say he was justified by faith and that was imputed to him for righteousness. He's already said that's the basis. But you see then how that by works a man is justified not by faith only in this context. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by deeds when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now he's not mixing faith with works like oil and water. You can't mix them. He's already said Abraham was justified by faith. Righteousness was imputed to him by faith. But he says a justifying faith will produce something in your life that will indicate to you and to others that you have a true biblical faith. Abraham's faith resulted in works. What kind of works? Well, in leaving Ur of Chaldees, God said, go out to a land that I will show you. He wandered about in tents and didn't know where he was going. Many years getting there. Finally arrived, God said, this is it. Hebrews 11, for example, indicates that. And he was justified by his working faith or faith to produce works when he offered Isaac on the altar. In fact, when he allowed himself to be circumcised and circumcised his family and passed that covenant on down to Israel. That's not just saying, oh, I believe this is a covenant, but he actually then let it produce the works of circumcision. Not works without faith, not works and faith, not works mixed with faith, but faith that works, faith that produces something in your life. See, it's not a contradiction between uh, James and Paul. Paul says works without faith is dead. James says faith without works is dead. How would you demonstrate it? How would you prove it? So say you'd have no way to express it because there's no vehicle to express faith through except your mouth. And James says, well, even the demons believe in God and confess that. How could they doubt it? It isn't saying I believe in God or I believe in Jesus. Jesus said a lot of people who call me Lord, Lord will never enter the kingdom. It's he that has the fruits 
the works that result from his faith, that does the will of my Father. Not saying I believe in God and he's got a will and it's a good will and he's righteous and whatever he'd require would be good. We ought to obey it. But if you don't obey it, he says, I don't know you. That's right. That's right. And yet you believe in God. Well, he says the devils believe in God. So if your neighbor has a need, James says, and you don't meet the need, and you say, well, be warm and clothed and go in peace, and I know God's a good God and he'll bless you, and I'll go home and pray for you that your needs will be met, he says that kind of faith is dead. If you've got the wherewithal, even if it's only a dollar or five minutes of your time to help or whatever, and you don't do it, he says, faith without works is dead. See, the burden of proof's on you if you see a need and don't meet it, and yet you tell us you've got faith. The burden of proof's on the man or woman who says, I've got faith, and it doesn't produce fruit in his life. That's why Jesus said, as we pointed out in the previous message on Romans 4, why Jesus said, it's by their fruits you will know them. Why didn't he say you'll know Christians by their faith? Because you can't see faith. You can only see the fruit of faith. You can only see the works of faith. And we have pointed out the fact that a man may say in verse 18, that thou hast faith and I have works, but show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. He says, Wilt thou know, O vain man? Now the word vain is foolish. That faith without works is dead. A person who just says he has faith and it doesn't produce anything in his life is a foolish person. His faith is emptiness or vanity. Paul uses Abraham to prove a man was justified without works. James takes the same example and proves that he was justified because he had a faith that did work. Paul says Abraham was justified by the belief of the promise of a son. James says Abraham proved he believed the promise by offering that son. They're both using the same example and showing the full balance of faith. In fact, James, in verse 23 here in chapter 2, as we've already pointed out, says Abraham was justified by faith. Then in chapter 1 of the book of James, he shows we the basis of justification, the basis of the new birth, the basis of salvation is faith in the word of God. Verse 18 of chapter 1, Of his own will God begat us with the word of truth. You see, it's the word of God by which we are born again, begotten. And then in verse 21, Therefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. He doesn't say anything about works saving us. He's talking about the kind of faith that save us, saves us will produce works. The next verse tells you that. It's the word that saves, but be you doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourself. And Paul, who is the apostle of faith, makes clear that faith that doesn't produce anything is not biblical faith. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, all Christians are always quoting that and neglect to read the 10th verse. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, By grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God. That's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Now that's clear. It's by grace through faith, not of works. But verse 10 says, But we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto the performing of good works, which God has before the world ordained that we should be walking in them. In what? In the good works. So they're not contradicting one another. They both say the same thing. Paul says Abraham was justified by faith without works, James says the same faith that justified Abraham put Isaac on the altar. Down in Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19, we have this, this truth set forth that his faith was a faith that produced something. By faith, verse 17, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises, you see, offered up his only begotten son. He had first believed the promises, now he offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Well, how could his seed be through Isaac if he's dead on an altar? All right, here's his faith. He accounted that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. In other words, he was already dead in Abraham's sight. That's what that last phrase means, that when God said, No, Abraham, 
I was just testing your faith, see if it's a faith that produces good works, and stopped him as the knife was descending. Abraham already saw him as dead. The knife was on the way to his heart. So when he untied him and took him off the altar, that was like receiving him from the dead. So he had already proved that he sacrificed Isaac because he went through all the motions that would have done it. And so when he received him back, the point is, his faith was such he believed that even though he slew his son in obedience to God's command, God would somehow raise him up because it was through Isaac, the descendants, or the Israelites, the nation, and uh, Christ himself was to come. Because remember, Abraham had the revelation of Christ through Isaac. So he had to believe all of that. And he didn't have all these scriptures we're looking at this morning. I don't know what he had in him. So accounting that God was able to raise him up, even the dead, from whence he also received him, in a figure. Now because of that kind of faith he received the gift of eternal life but he received another gift and that was the promise of a worldwide inheritance. God said your seed will be as the sand of the sea and the stars of heaven in multitude. Not only was that fulfilled in a natural sense but even in a greater sense the millions and millions and millions of believers are Abraham's children. Abraham's children and heirs to the promises made to Abraham in Galatians, know you therefore that they which are of faith are the children of Abraham. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed, the father of all those who have faith. Now why does the Bible over and over and over stress the faith of Abraham? Stress the fact that he's the father of the faithful. And if we have faith, we'll be children of Abraham. Because God purposely intended Abraham's life and walk of faith to be an example to us. Not only how you're justified by faith to receive salvation, which he did, but also as an example of how we are to walk by faith day to day as he did. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. Do you know any Christians who even believe that? 95% don't. And will fuss with you if you try to insist that the Bible means what it says there. We walk by faith and not by sight. You don't know if a Christian isn't walking 99% by sight. That 1% we hope is John 3, 16 faith. That's right. So he will be an example of how to walk by faith, be an example of holding fast to the promises of God without doubting, for God is faithful who makes the promise, Hebrews 10.23, to be an example of how we should ignore contrary circumstances. What could be more contrary than the medical reports? Well, man, are you crazy? You're 100, your wife's 90, she's been barren. We can prove medically it's impossible to have children. And in spite of the medical reports, he said, one day you'll see it. You'll see that new tooth there. You'll see that whatever it is manifested. You'll see that husband here at the altar crying out for mercy. Our wife. You'll see that unbelieving wife baptized in the Holy Ghost. He's to be an example of all that. He isn't in the Bible just to say, well, that's how we get saved, by believing God like he did. But what did he believe for? How did he believe? What was his experiences? He counted him who called things as not as though they were as the one who would fulfill an impossible thing and not a virgin birth, but a miracle birth. She was no virgin, but it was certainly a miracle birth. So all those who are faith are children of Abraham. To have the faith of Abraham is to be a child of Abraham. To be a child of Abraham is to have all of Abraham's blessings. Because Paul said we become heir of the promises made to him. Somebody in Canada counted them. I haven't, but if you want to, go ahead. You'll believe before you get past probably, oh, where? Numbers, Exodus, 1st, 2nd Kings. You'll take his word, 7,487 made to the believer. Over 40 in Psalm 37 alone. I always use that as an example because there you can believe God for a month and a half. You just take a promise a day. We become heir of all those promises, protection and deliverance and healing and health and victory and prosperity and joy and peace and the fruit of the Spirit and all of those things are promised to us. Amen, amen. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. There's just one of those 7,000 or more promises. Amen. That's what you're heir to. We're not just studying a Sunday school lesson. Let's talk about Abraham this Sunday and tomorrow we'll talk about Sarah. No, Abraham is not only an example 
but he is your spiritual father. So you ought to find out how he pleased God. He was a rich man. He lived to be 130, wasn't it? Well, how did he get there? He didn't have to battle cancers and you name it. Because he believed God. God said, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. If you obey me, hallelujah. In fact, he said, I'll take all sickness out of the midst of you if you will obey me. Hallelujah. Praise God. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for the promise in your word that we become the heirs of him who was chosen by you millenniums ago to be an example to all who by faith have pleased you. For you've said in your word, without faith it's impossible to please God in heaven. And those who are faith are blessed with faithful Abraham and become heir of all the promises made to him. We thank you for the revelation of this to our spirits because we're in an hour, we're living at a time when men professing to know thee can read it in your word and then change it and dilute it and explain it away. But by thy grace, we confess it will be those people in this end time who will take all the word and believe all the word and believe all that God has said and enjoy both your blessings and your pleasure. We ask this morning for the word of faith to be ministered to every heart at the point of the need and every need be met through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thy loving out there this morning. Faith as Abraham had it will save you. Paul said that we receive the baptism of the Spirit by faith and all the promises of God which include healing and health and prosperity and the salvation of your loved ones. Just exercise the faith of Abraham. If you have need of ministry, well you come. But you can reach out and touch the hem of Jesus' garment by faith this morning in those great promises offered to you. If you're a Gentile or a Jew, a Christian or a non-Christian, the invitation to believe the gospel has been presented to you this morning. Why don't you believe it? Why don't you receive what God has for you? Praise the Lord. Thy loving true to his word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, shake hands with your neighbor and we'll see you this evening.